Um, good afternoon or good morning everybody. I know there are people in um, New Zealand as well as in, other, in America and other countries watching. I'm Donald Nichols. Um, I'm a New Zealand uh, clarinet player and I travelled to the US to study in the sort of uh, second half of the 1990s and since then I've been back um, to play at various clarinet fests. I think I've done two, three, three, three. I've done I think five clarinet fests and an Oklahoma clarinet symposium um, and each time um, performing just New Zealand music. Um, what I'm going to do today is talk to you a little bit about the background of what happens here in this country and how it goes. Um, I've got some pieces I want to introduce you to, uh, introduce to you. It's not really comprehensive, like I can't talk about every single piece. When I first started writing or thinking about this um, little um, talk, I actually started going through all of the different categories of different pieces of music and it just ended up like, oh my god, it was going to take sort of three hours and, and not be particularly interesting. Um, so what I've got is I've got a series of pieces which I'm going to introduce. I've got a couple of pieces which I'm going to mention very briefly at the end, which I really don't have time for one reason or another to go into. Um, and I will talk a little bit just about general situation here. Um, but the other thing is that I'm going to try and make up a Word document with sort of summarizing most of the, the names of the pieces and the names of the composers and um, the website is one extremely useful website if you're interested in any music from New Zealand there's a, a website called sounds s-o-u-n-z um, and that website pretty much you can go there you can get links to performances there's all, all kinds of things you can buy things for include in a, in a um, text document which I'll be able to share with people um, so we'll talk about that at the end of the talk anyway but if yeah if you're there and you miss the name of a piece of music or something don't worry it's going to be easily accessible um, so New Zealand is a as um, some of you will know is a little country down in the South Pacific um, there, there's always been music played here. There was traditional music played by the, the First Nation, the Māori people here. Um, and of course there was, in colonial times, there was sort of music introduced and there have always been sort of tours and things. But in terms of Western classical music, a really strong tradition didn't really start here until sort of before, just sort of the interwar years between World War I and World War II. And our first full-time professional orchestra wasn't really started until uh, just, I believe, just after World War II. Um, so we've got a pretty sort of new, pretty young tradition. Um, and the very first composers that started writing in New Zealand were mainly influenced by the English composers, so Stanford, Vaughan Williams, Finzi, um, that lot. So, um, yeah, there was um, for a long time a lot of emphasis on England as, as the main sort of influence here. Now, as a young 15 year old, the first time I ever really played in a proper symphony orchestra that was like, you know, didn't have eight people on first clarinet and eight people on second clarinet and, and an alto saxophone playing the horn part, you know, it was like a proper symphony orchestra was uh, a national youth orchestra thing that we had and the very first morning i was my first plane ride actually too i flew down to, to a city called christchurch and i turned up on monday morning at this orchestra rehearsal with this clarinet part that was written out by hand which um, i was sort of quite surprised by i found it a lot harder to to read than all of the band parts i'd had at school and, and what and such um, and the first piece on that first morning, it must have been like 9 a.m. on Monday morning, was an overture called Aotearoa by a New Zealand composer, Douglas Lilburn. Um, now, Aotearoa is the Māori name for New Zealand. So this was sort of pretty interesting for me. I was like, not only is this a composer from New Zealand, it's a piece that's called, the name is called New Zealand in our native language. Now, um, Douglas Lilburn had just before World War II had gone over to England and had studied with Vaughan Williams uh, and then come back to New Zealand. Um, and he wrote in a very, very traditional 
style. Um, I actually think that overture Aotearoa is pretty awesome. It's kind of one of my favourite overtures actually. Um, but a couple, a, sort of a year later, I was really interested on a Sunday afternoon to turn on the TV and to see um, a fellow called um, John Robinson playing a, a clarinet sonata. It was actually a sonatina by Douglas Lilburn. So this would have been for me the pretty much the first piece of New Zealand music that I ever heard. And it's an interesting little sonatina because it's written for the A clarinet. Um, it's not particularly technically difficult. You, there's, a, there's a couple of little sticky passages, but it's actually really good if you've got students who've got this A clarinet and they, you know, they're going to play the Mozart concerto and the, and the Mozart and Brahms quintets. If you want some more music to get them to play their A clarinet, this is a really good little piece. Um, now, I'm just going to share the music with you, share screen, and you should be able to see the Douglas Lilburn Sonatina. Now, here's the thing, I'm going to play you a recording of it. <sighs> hmm, that's something I hadn't practiced. I wanted to play, um, I wanted to play it while I was looking at it. Now. Already I've managed to mess up. If you could get the audio playing, you should be able to switch the screen back to... Yep, I'll do that right now. No, why, what's happening? I'm very sorry, everybody. Stop share. Let's see if this is working. I'm just going to play you the first movement of this.
So um, that was the first movement of the Lilburn Sonatina. Um, that was just a concert last November. We're very lucky in New Zealand that we're able to have concerts uh, at the moment. We don't have any community cases of COVID. Um, that, that piece there, I think, has been played by a couple of people around the world. I know uh, Rosie Mazzeo um, used to use it for his teaching a fair bit, and Julian Kirk Doyle, I think, has recorded it on a CD in recent, recent years. Um, but that work was really the first sort of big significant New Zealand work, and it was written in 1948, for, actually for an American clarinet player who moved to New Zealand called George Hopkins. Um, pretty much in this first sort of 10 or 15 years after World War II, we've got the Lilburn Sonatina in 1948. There's an excellent concerto um, by John Ritchie, which has been recorded by American clarinet player Marina Sturm, among other people. It's, um, it really doesn't um, need any help promoting it. It's just a very good little concerto for clarinet and strings. So that's John Ritchie. Um, and then that was written in 1957. And then in 1963, a man called Ken Wilson wrote a clarinet concerto. Now, Ken is quite an important figure. There's, um, and he pretty much links in one way or another to every other single piece I'm going to write. He was a New Zealander who went to live in the United States and then had moved back to New Zealand. And then when he'd gone to do um, university study of the clarinet, um, as, a, as, an, uh, as an adult student, he, he went back to study. And um, he moved back to the USA and studied at Indiana University, actually. And um, then came back to New Zealand uh, in 1969, yeah. Now, um, a few of you might not realize this, but you actually already play music by Ken Wilson because he wrote uh, variations for clarinet quartet, the Paganini variations, which lots and lots of American clarinet quartets have played. Um, and it's actually just been recorded last year, uh, no, two or three years ago in New Zealand um, on, on a CD of Ken Wilson's music. But Ken wrote this brilliant uh, clarinet concerto in three movements. And this is 1963. And pretty much there's a pretty clear lineage from Lilburn to John Ritchie to Ken Wilson, kind of away from a very tonal, very post-romantic sort of uh, writing influenced by the English towards something that's a bit more modernist. Um, I'd like to play you just uh, the beginning of the Ken Wilson concerto because we actually have a recording available of him, uh, him playing it. And since then, um, Patrick Barry, who's the principal clarinet of the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra, Patrick has actually re recorded this piece, a really, really good recording. He's a, he's a stellar player. Um, but I'd just like to play you a little bit of this very interesting, uh, sorry, of this, um, of Ken actually playing it himself. Now, this is, here we go. Very sorry to do this. Okay. So someone's just asked a question if I'll be sharing the names and everything. And as I said at the beginning, yeah, I'm going to be uh, writing everything. Uh, writing everything down. I'm having a little bit of Zoom problems here. Why won't it go back to the Zoom screen? Yeah, so he could write them down and also we'll be collecting all of the resources. If there is anything you wanted us to share, we'd be happy to post it on the website for anyone to view later. Yeah, um, I've just got a little bit of a problem here and the Zoom has gone and is asking me to launch another meeting and all I want to do is share something. So I'm not really sure what's happened. Hang on, I know what's happened. Sorry, I'm trying to get back to the original Zoom meeting. What are you seeing so, now? Is it? I'm seeing, wow, you, you are, here we go. Uh, no. The cavalry has arrived. Do you need help? Yeah, I won't go back to the original Zoom meeting. Now that'll be a different link though, won't it? No. I don't think so. Sorry. Join new meeting. Where's your meeting that's already going on? Can you? Yeah. Ah, there we go. 
Okay, now we <laughs> You want to share music? Yeah, yeah. I, um, Remember to click the buttons. That's okay. And that one there. And this one there. There you go. <laughs> there we go. Um, okay. Now, so, <laughs> this is really embarrassing. Um, yeah, I'm just using Macintosh, and this thing is different. Let's, let's just blame the computer. So, this, I'm just going to play you a couple of minutes of this. Um, but this is recorded in, I think, 1970, a very early recording. It's Ken um, playing the f beginning of the first movement of his clarinet concerto. So um, what I need to do is work out how to fade things out because it always sounds very brutal just to stop in the middle of the piece. But um, that, that was Ken recorded his concerto in uh, 1970. Um, I can remember uh, meeting some, uh, uh, I think it was John Scott who was actually at Indiana University with him. And Dr. Scott said to me that his uh, nickname had been Fingers Wilson because he had very, very fast technique. And it's worth noting that the, the Wilson Clarinet um, Concerto, was spo uh, um, the timing, the rec sort of recommended timing that the publishers give is 15 minutes. But when Ken recorded it, he recorded it in 12 minutes and 40 seconds. Um, he, he had very amazing technique of play everything very fast. But actually I think the piece sounds great at a slower tempo anyway, because you can hear a little bit more of the detail. So, um, we want to keep moving here, and hopefully I won't have any more um, Zoom crashes trying to share things. Very sorry about that. Um, but Ken um, was extremely influential as a teacher, um, f as a player, as a, um, as a composer. And of course, doing those three things, he was an example to, to any number of the people who followed him, because um, he was sort of like, the complete package and we, we know that there's there's people who still do this you know there's um john russell there yeah there's there's no shortage of, of performers who compose um but he was extremely influential in that a number of people followed him and pretty much every um piece that's that i'm now going to mention has some link to ken and this is one of the things about new zealand of course it's very small so 
uh, it's a little bit of a, a overstating it to say that everybody knows everybody, but um, we definitely don't need you know um, too many uh, what's the um, steps and sorry I've, I've just crashed now so um, those three pieces you can see are moving away from a more traditional style. Um, Douglas Lilburn, who was the first composer I mentioned, the first piece I played, he actually um, made a decision about his composition in 1966. He'd been writing all of these beautiful harmonic things. And in 1966, he decided that the future of the music was to move into sort of electronic music and more sort of uh, avant-garde type influences. So he actually founded an electronic music studio in New Zealand and just completely changed his style and started writing these sort of um, more avant-garde pieces. Now, pretty much there's a sort of a gap between then and until the sort of beginning of the 1980s where there don't seem to be many clarinet pieces played, now um, composed. I don't know whether that's just because of my ignorance, maybe I need to do more research, but really the only piece that falls into that time gap that I know is a, a really excellent piece um, by Christopher, a fellow called Christopher Blake called Towards Peace, and there's a really good recording of that by Patrick Barry on YouTube. Um, as I said, I'll, I'll have all of this information in a text document to share with people. Um, but pretty much until the 1980s, there doesn't, don't seem to be many really significant pieces written that, that I'm aware of. Um, the next piece I want to talk about is Peter Skoll's, a piece called Wireless. And Peter, of course, um, is an interesting fellow because he was my clarinet teacher, but he was also a student. He was a student of George Hopkins, who the Lilburn Sonatina had been written for, and he was a student of Ken Wilson. And um, Peter uh, was the principal clarinet of the Philharmonia Orchestra here in, in Auckland for, uh, I think, 15 years before he sort of went solo and he now does conducting and composing and conducts the Auckland Chamber Orchestra. Um, so Peter went and wrote this piece called Wireless in 1987. And I'm gonna bring up the score of it. Um, and hopefully it'll work this time. Um, this piece was uh, played when Peter went in uh, 1988, he traveled and played in a competition in um, the Netherlands, the Gary Amos competition. And he um, won a prize um, for this performance of this. Now, this piece was the first piece that I really heard that had a lot of extra effects and multi, it has multiphonics in it, it has some microtone trills and, and things. Um, there isn't actually a, a, a recording that I'd like to share with you of this that's available on the, on the net and I didn't get time to make a recording of it myself. So I'm going to play a few little, just a few little bits just to talk about it. Um, hopefully you guys can see the music that's up there. And um, I've just got the first page here, and if I scroll down, you can see at the bottom of the first page, there's some multiphonics written in. Um, because Peter is a clarinet player, it's what I notice that's really interesting is that there's a few things here that actually look really difficult when you see them on the music. And they've, they're actually, he kind of, when he was composing, he sort of knew the shortcuts and such. So this opening, for instance, it's very high and very loud, but the fingerings for that are actually really easy if you use this for F sharp and this for the high A flat. Now, I performed the American premiere of this piece at the uh, Oklahoma Clarinet Symposium in 19, um, 1995, and people said that the opening was sort of pretty crazy. There used to be an advertisement for a stereo system where it had this man like sitting in an armchair with his hair and his tie and everything sort of being blown backwards by the speakers. And I think someone said to me that that's what it was like hearing this. So if I'm demonstrating this, I want to be very careful because I don't want to like destroy the, your, everybody's computer system. So I'm actually gonna face away a little bit. But this very opening, if you use those fingerings, I'm just gonna play a couple of notes. If you use those fingerings for this altissimo opening, It's actually not 
very tricky at all. I hope that didn't like kill anybody's ears. Um, but this, this piece has got some really marvellous little things in it. One of the um, magic moments in this piece is when you start the second movement, which isn't showing on this page here. But the second movement, you actually start from nothing. And um, I can remember when I first played this to Peter, I was like kind of a bit embarrassed because my keys were clacking and everything. And he said, no, 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 I want all of that key noise. So um, rather than trying for the sort of Bonard silent fingers as they come down, you actually, it sounds really good if when you're just playing the silent, you've got this real kind of percussion effect happening. Um, hopefully that came over the camera, you could hear that. Now, that little section there on the second page, you've also got to do circular breathing in it. And uh, I can remember learning this piece, uh, living in a house with a very long corridor and just walking up and down the corridor playing that and practicing circular breathing to see how long I could go for. And I think once I managed to keep doing that passage for about 12 minutes or something. Um, so this piece wireless, we've got a few effects like that, like circular breathing coming in out of nothing. Um, if I have a look at the bottom of this page here, we can see that there are some multiphonics written in. Um, and um, that very first one is just a low E overblown. Um, if your reed's a little bit too soft, it tends to jump in too quickly. But he actually wants you to keep the bottom note while you're playing the multiphonic. And the second one's a little bit easier to control. So I um, hope you weren't following the music too closely. I, was, I, I might have been a little bit approximate there. But it was just to give you the idea. You can hear that um, the bottom note keeps going, but then there's also like an interplay between the bottom note and the top and, and the multiphonic. So this is a this is a really good piece to have as an unaccompanied piece to sort of start off and, and learn. If I look through the rest of the piece, there's definitely other things sort of worth mentioning. Um, it's not too heavy on the multiphonics, really. I think once you've done that first bit, I don't think you get another multiphonic. No, you don't. And um, the last, the end of the last movement, the third movement of it, uh, really is got this quite a cool. Um, Rhythm, sort of minimalist influence there and there's a few places where we've got to do things which again on the music look really difficult like this bit here at the bottom of that page is actually just which so one, once you actually learn that fingering it's really it's really easy to do I have played pieces that used microtones that were just like a nightmare to play using all of these crazy different fingerings. But this piece, Wireless, it's, it's sort of, I think, just over 10 minutes long. Um, and it's really excellently written in that um, all of the stuff there is quite, is quite idiom idiomatic to the clarinet. So um, Wireless is also interesting because it's showing the influence of the uh, sort of avant-garde ultra-modernists and, and minimalist composers kind of sort of morphed together. Um, the next piece I'd like to show you, let's just get rid of this here, stop share. The next piece I'd like to talk about is um, a, a um, concerto for, for bass clarinet and cello. And to my knowledge, this has only been performed, like when it was first written, it was performed, I think, around 1999. And then... Uh, with the Auckland Chamber Orchestra, we did um, a performance and a recording of it sort of in the next year or so after that. And I'm unaware of any other performances since then. There may have been some. Um, but I think this is a really excellent piece by a, a composer who's the uh, professor of composition at Otago University, which is a city in the south of New Zealand um, called Dunedin. 
And um, Anthony Ritchie, the composer, is also the son of John Ritchie, who was the guy who wrote a concerto that I mentioned with the sort of the first three great pieces, Lilburn, John Ritchie, and Ken Wilson. So this Anthony Ritchie uh, piece is a double concerto for um, bass clarinet and cello. And I've got um, a little link to it, just so that I can play you the first sort of openings. It's from, um, it's from a web page that's the, the thing for selling the recording of it. Um, and so it jumps, it jumps, just plays like the first movement of the, of the, sorry, the first minute of the first movement and the beginning of the second movement. It gives you a really good idea of the piece. Um, it's, um, it, it will jump a little bit abruptly from one to the other. But I'm just going to make sure I'm actually sharing that. I keep on thinking that I'm sharing and, and um, I'm not. So this is uh, from a double concerto for bass clarinet and cello. And um, Anthony Ritchie, it's a really lovely piece. just to give you an idea of that. Now that's, um, I don't know of many concertos written for bass clarinet and cello, so that's a really good one to uh, hunt out if you want to do something that's very unique. It's also sort of very, very lis listenable. Um, if you're searching for that one, um, you have to be a little bit careful because somehow there's a misspelling of clarinet um, it's a ba base clarient is somehow ended up on the internet and that's been copied and perpet perpetuated so I think on YouTube it's the same you've got to look for it as base clarient rather than base clarinet but I'll include that info in the um, document that I share um, that's beautiful the first movement the lullaby you heard he's he's based it on the Brahms lullaby but really um, cleverly didn't actually doesn't reveal that until the very end of the movement where you hear the little tune from the Brahms lullaby played on the glockenspiel. Um, the third movement of that is uh, just a solo kid sort of cadenza, well it's not a solo, it's a, a duo cadenza for the bass clarinet and the cello which is in memoriam for a friend of his, Angela Campbell, who passed away. Um, so that's, that's a really uh, excellent piece which I think really deserves to be played much, much more often. Now the next uh, one that I want to go to is um, a piece by a composer called Alex Taylor who um, wrote this one in 2010 for a very unusual ensemble, um, a string quartet with a clarinet but also with a countertenor singing and I talked with him about the possibility of doing it with a soprano rather than with a countertenor and he was quite receptive to that 
but uh, because I've never since actually programmed a performance of it with that combination, he hasn't got around to doing the um, transcript, the sort of the changes. I assume he wanted to do a few little changes. But um, this recording that I've got, just to listen to a few little bits of it, uh, with, a, with a counter tenor, and also this piece, even though it's quite a small ensemble, actually is just way better if you do it with a conductor, because there's lots of portions of it that have sort of very sort of lots of um, sustained sounds uh, without rhythmic activity. And then when there is rhythmic activity, quite often it's very sort of pointillist. Um, there isn't a, someone who's playing the clear beat. Um, there are also portions of it that are quite playable without the conductor. And um, one of the things I like about this piece is that it kind of encompasses quite a few different styles sort of through within the piece. Unfortunately, it's 18 minutes long, and so for me to really illustrate that, I'd have to like pick and go through. I'm just going to play you a little bit of it, but um, this piece is called 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird, which of course is the famous Wallace Stevens poem from 1917, which um, to my knowledge has inspired eight different pieces that, by composers that I, that I could find. And of course, the eighth blackbird is named uh, the, the contemporary music group. The eighth blackbird is named after this poem. Um, but Alex wrote this beautiful piece. It's 18 minutes long, and the whole first four minutes are really just a kind of a um, a build up. And I'd love to be able to play it all to you, but of course, I'm keeping my eye on the time. I'm now sort of running short here, so I'm just going to play you a little bit of this, and again. This is starting about four minutes into the piece, and there's been quite a long, slow, um, very atmospheric build-up. Um, and we've just got to this point where it's starting to get a little bit more activity happening. So I'm just going to play you a few minutes from the middle of this piece. So this is 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird by Alex Taylor. Ah, no, hang on. Stop. is more sensible. <clears throat> Sorry. So that was from a live recording in 2011, I think. Um, a great little piece. So those two pieces I just talked about, the Anthony Ritchie Double Concerto and the Alex Taylor uh, 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird, are both pieces that I, I really think deserve more performances, and I don't um, know if they have had repeat performances, actually. Um, 
Now, the Alex Taylor, uh, both Alex Taylor and Anthony Ritchie have written lots of other really good pieces. Um, Alex has written quite a lot of piece, music that's very modernist. Um, and there's a really good solo piece by him called Deep Walker. But uh, right now, we don't have too much time. The next couple of pieces I'm going to talk about very briefly are really uh, well-established um, pieces. Um, the first one is by Dame Gillian Whitehead, who is a, a composer, New Zealand composer. She studied with Peter Maxwell Davies and with um, Peter Sculthorpe in Australia. And she was actually the she a lecturer in composition and then the head of the composition department at the Sydney Conservatory of Music in Australia for about 15 years. Um, there's a piece that I want to show by her called um, Mata O, which is uh, a solo clarinet piece that she wrote in 2010. Um, and uh, the name is a Māori name, which is uh, the name of the river, the name of the, the river um, it's in English it's called the Clutha River um, and she was on a, um, a composing residency down in a house that overlooked this river and so she felt quite inspired by all of the different currents and whirlpools and everything. Um, so Mata O um, is this piece and this really throws everything at you as a as a clarinet player you're going to have to sing while you're playing you're going to have to do multiphonics microtones um, tone trills where you're playing a note and, and going between two different fingerings of the same note and fl flutter tonguing so this is a, a really excellent piece now the um, first performance of it i believe was anna mcgregor who's a New Zealand clarinet player who plays in um, Sweden now. And um, it's, it's definitely had a few performances since then. I got to move this back to the beginning. Um, but it's a really excellent solo piece. It's really well structured too in terms of form, in terms of bringing some material back, um, sharing things. Here we go. This is Mata O by Gillian Whitehead. And this is Peter Scholes playing it. So um, that's uh, an excellent piece by Gillian Whitehead. I was originally going to play a bit longer section of that, but I keep an eye on the time here. We're running short on time. Now, um, um, yeah, it would be really good to hear the bits where, he, where he's singing, but you've, it's, um, if you've ever had to do that, I haven't got my clarinet set up now, it's a really difficult little effect to do. The composer will write the notes in, and you've got to blow 
while you're going mm, and yeah it, it can create quite a cool effect so that's um gillian whitehead or we're actually supposed to call her dame gillian whitehead um and it's a, again it's in the sort of more modernist tradition now i've just got a couple of other little pieces i want to play and this piece here um, next piece i want to talk about is by a, a young uh, female composer in wellington natalie hunt and natalie hunt first came to my attention um, when i actually played a, a little duet by her um, I think it was at clarinet. It was at clarinet fest or at the Australian clarinet fest. I can't remember. But what I'm going to do is just share you a little performance of this, um, this duet. It's a really cool little duet called Ladybird. So this should work. So that's just a little bit of lady, bu ladybug, not ladybird. Um, Nat Natalie first came to my attention um, when, in 2011, the New Zealand Clarinet Quartet and a trio we have here called the Solaris Trio went to play at Clarinet Fest in Los Angeles, and we played uh, two little quartet pieces by her called Kaka and Piwaka Waka, which are named after native birds. Um, so. In 2017, Natalie Hunt got commissioned to write a quartet for a chamber music festival. Um, and um, um, James Campbell was coming over to play with members of the New Zealand, uh, New Zealand Trio, which is a... Um, no. I've just messed it up. Here we go. Very sorry. I'm going to share this right now. It's clarinet quartet. And again, I'd like to play more of it, but it's actually quite a long piece. And
So sorry to cut that off so short. I really would like to play you more of that. But it's a really excellent uh, quart quartet piece, um, of course, for the clarinet, violin, viola, cello quartet grouping. Um, that one was commissioned specifically for that uh, festival, Chamber Music Festival that, has been, that recording was from. And um, at the time that Natalie was writing it, there was a big earthquake. And the building that she was sort of using as her, her places that she'd go to to compose actually got shut down because, because they were deemed they needed to be inspected to see if they were safe because they'd had some earthquake damage and everything. So there's, a, there's quite a, a sort of a, a backstory about, about that. She'd originally envisaged writing a kind of a jazzy, really jazzy, upbeat piece. And the piece that she's come up with really, um, the word I'd use to describe it, it's like a lament. It does have a fast central section, but it's a really beautiful piece. Now, all of this is available through a New Zealand website called Sounds, sounds.org.nz. Um, and I'll, uh, inc I'll make an, a link to that all sort of available. Um, you can also, for a lot of these composers, like for Ken Wilson and for Natalie Hunt, you can also find interviews with them or people, in the case of Ken Wilson, um, conductor doing a sort of a talk about him. There's lots and lots of uh, information available through sounds. Now, I'm going to have to finish in just a, a couple of minutes, but um, there were quite a few pieces that I really, really wanted to include and couldn't. Um, a man called John Elmsley wrote a piece called Dialogues 2 for clarinet and piano. In fact, I've got the music sitting here. I've got an old-fashioned, old-fashioned, written-out score. Um, and that, that's a really excellent piece for clarinet and piano. John Rimmer, and John Elmsley and John Rimmer were both uh, professors in composition at Auckland University. John Rimmer wrote a trio for E-flat clarinet, B-flat clarinet, and bass clarinet called Murmurs which is just awesome. It's virtuosic as well. You've got to like practice your butt off if you're ever going to play it, but it's a really, very, very good piece. Um, and there's a fellow called Ross Harris, a uh, composer, excellent composer, who teaches at the New Zealand School of Music. Um, he wrote some really beautiful duos, tiny little duos, um, all sort of like a minute long, called Three Lines in a Circle. Um, and those, I think, we played at Clarinet Fest in 2006 at Atlanta. Um, but they're really excellent for using for teaching because there's lots of unison sort of pitches. You've got to come in on unison pitches and things. But he wrote a really significant um, unaccompanied solo piece called Four Laments. Um, so I'll include that down on the, on the text document. Um, those, so you've got contacts for those if you want to look up those. But the last thing I just wanted to play was a piece by Gareth Farr. Because Gareth Farr is a very successful composer, probably doesn't need too much help, his pieces have all been recorded. He did an excellent piece called Waipua, which is the name of a forest in Northland that has these giant kauri trees, big huge trees. Um, and he wrote an excellent um, duo for E-flat clarinet and B-flat clarinet called Five Little Monologues. Um, and so he, when he was writing, he was thinking of the E flat clarinet and the B flat clarinet were sort of mixed together so to make one monster instrument. So he wasn't really thinking of them as a duo, or um, he was thinking of like sort of creating one instrument by mixing the two. And unfortunately, there's no recording of those on the web, and um, I wasn't able to get one to play to you guys. But that's a really, really good little piece. But the last thing I'm just going to play, just before we go, just we can hear is a really great little piece by him. It's like a little concerto for clarinet and orchestra, but it's really just a series of short pieces called uh, Te Parenga. And there's a whole story behind that, which we don't have time for, but it's gone. Yes, no, there it is. <laughs> I just had this like thing. I went to share it and I'm like, damn it, I can't see it. There it is. So I'm just going to play you. It's like two minutes long. I'm going to play you this little piece. started on the wrong piece. Thank you. 
so we really don't have time because I can see I've reached the end of my uh, available time I'm sorry but I just wanted to play a little bit of that because that was intended to show that there was a sort of um, uh, we started off with sort of very romantic harmonic pieces and we ended with a romantic harmonic piece and in the middle there were a sort of kaleidoscope of different styles well, um, I, I'm so Secretly, about all of this bar that we haven't known about. So um, we're really, really. I know many are very um, as a result of this presentation. So I'm really grateful to you. And I'm really to be able to get you the resource from Donald um, as soon as we can. And thank you so much, Donald, for this presentation. Um, we here real quick. So um, oh, Jess Jessica's, Jessica's cutting out, but I was just going to say that if anyone wants to contact me for names of pieces or for this, this written summary that I've mentioned like 50 times, just friend me on Facebook. Pretty much for the next couple of days, any friend requests I get, if it looks like it's from a clarinet player, I'll just click accept. And um, it's pretty easy to find me. There's, there's a, I th I'm, I've got a photo of me on it. You can see me wearing a little cap, I think. Um, but yeah, just friend me on Facebook and I can forward anything to you as well.